for epilepsy, there is hope. Hey podcast listeners, Tori Robinson here for Epilepsy Sparks Insights, a podcast about epilepsy, epilepsy research, common comorbidities, and all of the fascinating science behind it. Whether you have epilepsy, are a family member, a neurologist, neuropsychiatrist, therapist, neurophysiologist, scientist, or researcher, Epilepsy Sparks Insights is designed to help you learn more about epilepsy from the other side of the table. I'm a person with epilepsy and some missing brain tissue. I hope to help bridge the unnecessary gap between patients, the public, and the aforementioned. Because epilepsy research and science are cool. Last week, we had a really informative, inspiring conversation with Professor Leigh Sander from UCL Queen Square who, as well as doing incredible work for people affected by epilepsy in the UK, is also empowering those in low to middle income countries when it comes to epilepsy prevention, treatment and seizure control. This week, we are talking to Professor Gavin Woodall, a neuropharmacologist from Aston University, Birmingham, UK, and also a director for the Institute for Health and Neurodevelopment. Or actually, as the rather modest Gavin would say, Mostly, I just run a lab. So Gavin is an epilepsy researcher, particularly interested in severe epilepsy syndromes, with the key question of his being, what makes a brain develop epilepsy, aka eleptogenesis? If you're new to the channel, do make sure that you subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. Because this is a weekly podcast slash video, don't go anywhere, stay with us. Hey Gavin, hello, thanks for being here. Hi Tori. Please tell everyone about yourself. What is your title um, as such and what is your role? Okay, well, um, I'm a professor of neuropharmacology. Uh, so the chemicals that, that make brains and brain cells do stuff uh, here at Aston University. I'm also uh, one of the directors of the Institute for Health and Neurodevelopment that we've got here as well. Cool. Um, but mostly I just run a lab and we do experiments uh, and research on, on epilepsy. You say just, it's more than just. So what, what does your research involve? Um, so I'm interested in particularly in children with really difficult to treat epilepsy. Um, syndromes where um, uh, you might be on five or even six drugs at the same time and still not get seizure control. Things like Dravet syndrome and, and, and stuff like that. Um, I'm interested in why um, epileptic brains become epileptic. How does the mm. seizures become established in the brain, in the circuitry in the brain? Um, and I spend a lot of my time um, looking at that process and asking whether we can find new drugs. Uh, and really to look for drugs that will treat um, the underlying disease and not just the seizures themselves. What I'm trying to do is find something that reverses that process of establishment of of epilepsy in the brain. So can you tell everyone what do you mean by establishment of disease? Establishment of the epilepsy itself? Uh, if you've got a perfectly uh, intact brain with no trouble at all, uh, uh, everything is wired up just perfectly, if you uh, induce an epileptic seizure in that brain then you make it a little bit more likely that that brain will have another seizure later down the line. Could be a few weeks, could be a few months, maybe even a couple of years. But you change the chances of a seizure happening. And that is because a seizure itself is brain activity and that brain activity alters the way the brain is wired up and structured to make it more likely that another seizure will happen. So once you've had several seizures, the chances of having a further seizure are, are much, much higher uh, than if you've only had a, uh, one seizure. And that process, we call it um, epileptogenesis, so the creation of epilepsy in the brain. And that's what fascinates me. What, what's different about a brain circuit that has a tendency towards seizure activity compared to a brain circuit that doesn't have that tendency? Why does it fascinate you? What got you into it? What got me into it? Yeah. Um, I got into it because um, I've, I've found it fascinating that um, it's, it's such a complex structure, the brain. It's such a difficult thing to imagine how it could ever work correctly. Um, epilepsy is all about too many brain cells doing the same thing at the same time. But, but given that we've got billions of brain cells, you would think that there's the chances of them all doing the wrong thing at the wrong time would be hugely high. 
Um, so to me, the brain's up there as, as just the most fascinating object in the universe. Um, you know, it's, it's the most complicated thing in the universe by some distance. Um, and, you know, it's just a fascinating thing. And I've, I've, I've been interested in the brain um, ever since I started out being a scientist. There are heaps of things that, or heaps of issues with, with our brains, um, evidently. So, but why did you end up focusing on the epilepsies? I was influenced a lot by uh, research that I was reading when so I was an undergraduate at university. Um, and the laboratory that I ended up doing my PhD in was an epilepsy laboratory. Uh, and Howard Wheel, who was the professor who ran that lab back in the 1970s and 80s, um, took me on as a summer student uh, and I got to work in his lab in the summer um, making the first um, ever organotypic cultures of, um, of brains so slicing brains up into little slices like toast and then keeping them alive. <laughs> like toast. toast? Yeah, like toast. Yeah, I always say. Um, when you say like toast, it makes me think of a bit of fried brain. So I assume it's <laughs> well, not fried brain tissue. No, they, they weren't fried. No, although my grandmother used to eat brains in that way yeah before it became a distinctly uh, a medically risky thing to do um, just to clarify not human brains no no it's not human yeah brain. okay cool so so yeah we, we we used to grow brains and i was part of the sort of original uh, team of people that was trying to trying to grow those brains and one of the things at the time it was a problem was that they became epileptic uh, when you slice up a brain and grow it the, the trauma of being sliced up like toast means that you end up with an epileptic brain um now that was a, a problem for us at the time and turned out to be an absolutely fabulous opportunity and i now have exactly that system going in the lab because it's a really easy way to look at epileptic brains and whether a new drug works you just pop some drug onto one of these brain cultures and if it responds you know you've got a candidate new drug for treating epilepsy if you could tell everyone like you take where do you get your brain and i'm presuming in advance from our conversation that it's already from a person with epilepsy but then do you kind of make it more epileptic by chopping it up so there are numerous ways that you can study um, epilepsy um, you can take a rat or a mouse and you can uh, make them have a seizure um, they recover from that seizure um, and then they'll be absolutely fine for weeks and even months and then they'll start to develop um, epilepsy um, and as the epilepsy becomes established the seizures get more and more frequent and then you can study those brains alternatively you can take a perfectly normal brain and you can slice it up like toast as I said before that very process of damaging the brain makes it react in a way that uh, engenders epilepsy in the tissue and you can keep those in culture so you have what, the equivalent of a fridge but it, it, it keeps everything warm instead of cold and it oxygenates it you can grow your brains for weeks at a time and study that process of development of epilepsy but all of this is a bit artificial it's, it's rat brain and not human brain so one of the things that we also do is we go over to the children's hospital where my friends uh, uh, who are surgeons um, are taking bits of brain out of children with really difficult to treat epilepsy in order to stop the seizures so if you can remove the focus of the seizures from a, from a child's brain they might have fewer seizures uh, and it's a really good high success rate for that kind of surgery today i had that done it, that was what happened with me okay, so yeah okay. no, so totally you, a fan you know about yeah. that um but rather than just give that tissue to the pathologists to say that you know there's nothing much to see here um, the surgeons give it to me and I bring it back to my lab and I slice it up and some of it we record from using electrodes to record the electrical activity and other bits of it we grow in culture and keep it alive and then we can look at the processes that we see in the mice and the rats in human brain uh, and work out whether our animal models are worthwhile and that's a really important thing for me uh, as a scientist is to know that um, the experiments I do are you know have a point and, and, and are going to help people. So we test the same drugs in the human brain as well as in the, the rat brain. Uh, and, and we test the same other different approaches to understanding epilepsy in both as well. So there's multiple ways you can look at epilepsy. Um, you can look at it really acutely um, or you can look at it really chronically over months and months and months. And we, we do all of those approaches in the lab. 
And can I ask how you grow that brain tissue? So you've got a, a, a slither in, in, I don't know, is it like your Petri dish or, uh, and how do you, and how do you make it grow? How do you feed it? You, you can't grow it. All you can do is keep it um, alive. Um, brain tissue generally doesn't want to grow. Um, what you do is you make a slice of it. It's, I would say about half a millimeter thick. And then you put it on a little nylon mesh, which allows oxygen and nutrients to come through from above and below. Um, it's like a Petri dish, but it's only a centimeter wide. Um, and you then bathe the little slice of brain in nutrient media that keep the brain um, really happy with lots of oxygen, some carbon dioxide in there as well to maintain the correct body pH and stuff like that. And off we go. Uh, and it'll stay alive for three, four, five weeks at a time. And you can do all sorts of in interesting experiments on it while it's maintained. Amazing. Amazing. So you've been doing this research for like a number of years now. And what have you learnt over the past couple of decades or however long it has been? And how have things progressed? But things have progressed really well. Um, so we, we've learnt that um, brains aren't static, so activity in a brain um, alters the every aspect of the function of that brain. So imagine um, in, in a brain you've got a whole bunch of um, neurotransmitters and, and receptors that are exciting neurons, switching them on and making them do their thing, which is really just to send a, a, a signal to another neuron. Um, and then in, in counterbalance to that, you've got a whole bunch of inhibitory um, transmitters and receptors and what they do is tell the neurons to, to shut up and calm down and that balance is in constant flux in the brain so if there's a lot of activity in the neurons it tends to make everything less excitable and by contrast if there's very little activity in the brain then the excitability of the, the neurons the brain cells goes up in compensation and we're starting to understand now how all those compensation mechanisms fit together and to understand that they go wrong in people with epilepsy those compensation mechanisms are probably the the very cause of epilepsy the experiments that we've been doing have shown that um, that a seizure can produce a really profound change in um, the proteins and the, the synapses in the brain um, and make brain cells really really quiet um, and, and that quiescence in the brain cells that sort of silence in the activity of the brain actually leads to processes that make the brain um, much more excitable than it should be later down the line and so we're starting to uncover a pathway now um, from an initial seizure to a whole bunch of changes that go on in neurons that lead later on to the recurrence of, of the seizures so so there's an initial insult we call it to the brain something makes the brain have a seizure uh, and then yeah. there's a gap where a whole bunch of processes go on and then the epilepsy s starts to happen further down the line. The longest I've seen is, is um, a rat who, who had a seizure and then a year and a half later started to become epileptic. Um, you know, so it can take a really wow. long time. And I mean, because every one of us is at some sort of risk of epilepsy, right? Developing uh, or starting epileptogenesis. It's just it's on a scale yeah different brains have different risks it depends how old you are how young you are yeah. you know if you want um if you consider a, a young child two or three years old then then their biggest risk for seizures would be getting too hot if they had an infection or a fever um you know yeah. in an older person then the risk of seizures might be related more to um, having had a stroke or having Alzheimer's disease, for example. So chances of having seizures following a stroke are uh, one in three, really. Um, and it's, it's quite prevalent in Alzheimer's disease as well. So seizures, in a way, are a kind of um, final common path for, for all sorts of different things that happen in the brain. You can end up in seizures. Brain infections, for example, can lead to seizures. And so can tumours. I've seen a or read a recent study um, about climate change and how the increase and in fluctuation in temperature of the earth is or is likely to lead to more seizures in people with epilepsy um, because we can often struggle to deal with it. Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, and, and, and of course, the um, climate change will bring um, conflict and more stress and stress can cause people to 
to have more seizures so yep there's there's many many ways in which that can affect uh, people with epilepsy it's a really difficult question well how, what does the future hold for your research well I, i've been involved with um a, a drug company that, that develops uh, the cannabidiol based um epilepsy medicines that, that are now being really effective in uh, in people with difficult mm -hmm. to treat epilepsy um i'm involved with another company now that's got a, a a completely different approach i'm not allowed to say what it is unfortunately at the moment um the future for my research is very much mm -hmm. in developing uh, more new drugs more new compounds to treat uh, epilepsy and as i said at the start in in trying to treat the actual underlying causes of of epilepsy rather than just the seizures uh, and to do that, we have to use these multiple different approaches that we're using in the lab uh, and, and try and understand this establishment process. So I'm excited about the future. There's, there's lots and lots of new things uh, coming along, lots of new drugs we're interested in. Um, I'm on the phone tomorrow to some colleagues in North Carolina who've got um, a massive library. Why would that be interesting? Well, it's a library of drugs. Um, and they're so clever that they can tag all of these drugs with a little DNA address label. So we can screen them, these drugs. Um, so it, does this drug look similar to something that I'm interested in that acts on a particular target in epilepsy? Uh, and if it does, and if it binds, if it does the same things, they can read the little label and then I can identify which drug was the one that was, was doing the right thing. So we're, we're going to get involved with those guys and they're going to give us access to, to millions of different new molecules that we can try and look for anti-epileptic activity. In. That sounds really exciting. But so to manage people's expectations, because, you know, when you're affected by the epilepsies or your child's affected or whatever, mm -hmm. you're you quite frankly, we can become desperate the work that you're doing now as a in in general how do you think that might impact the treatment for so, people in the future and when is the the future look, there's two two ways to answer that so the fundamental stuff takes years you know and then people have to be prepared for you know five or ten year or 15 year timelines with that kind of research um but when you're looking at new drugs uh, it all depends on how you pick your drug. So I'm really interested and, and excited by the prospect of something called drug repurposing. So mm -hmm. all the drugs for things that fail tend to fail, uh, you know, quite late in the process of drug development. Um, but if you can use a drug that's already passed through human trials and is found to be safe, um, then that gives you a real speed up in your ability to bring a, a new anticonvulsant drug to market. And the drugs that we're interested in uh, at the moment are already established as antidepressants. Um, and, and so that could be, uh, it could mean that, that you know, the, the cycle is much faster with these drugs. So we're repurposing it away from being an antidepressant and into being an anticonvulsant. And funnily enough, it works both ways. Some of the anticonvulsant drugs are actually really good antidepressants as well. Ah, uh, yes. Um, which one is it? Um, I've, I've forgotten. Epilepsy brain. Um, the name. Um, is it yes, lamotrigine? Is supposed to be is, is a mood stabilizer, yeah, isn't on. it? Yeah. yeah. You can be an honorary neurofarmacologist. <laughs> I know, don't I? Can't. Um, <laughs> and um, so there's a. At least appears to many people to be quite a line drawn between the genetic epilepsies and the non-genetic epilepsies although having said that some people can get bashed on the head and develop epilepsy and some people will not so which sort of what side of of the table are you on genetic not genetic or a bit of both bit of both really um because if you if you've got a genetic mutation that leads to seizures then those seizures will drive the same processes um to make the brain more susceptible to seizures that that you would see in somebody who, who has epilepsy that we, we can't find a cause for so similar processes go on in the genetic epilepsies as well as in the non-genetic epilepsies um you know the, the genetic ones get a little bit of a short shrift in some cases i think um because often they're very rare and etc etc but it can also be a real opportunity um because new drugs like cannabidiol epidiol x um, we're able to be funded and brought to market because of, of, of initial trials in, in Dravet syndrome and, and some of the genetic epilepsies 
and because of the US uh, system and, and, and EU systems allow um, for to, to accelerate research in, in that kind of domain where you've got what they call orphan diseases um, so, so it, 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 can, it can be a positive as well in terms of drug development so yeah I'm, I'm interested in both um, but, but my main focus is as I say on this underlying process like the cause and because uh, like prevention would be a whole lot better than management or potentially cure yes and um you know and brains are um, amazingly plastic things um you know mm. and, and that plasticity is is really really interesting if if i'm looking at the football at the moment like a lot of people i'm enjoying the euros <laughs> if you um if you tear your cruciate <laughs> ligament um then your brain doesn't get the signals from your knee joints to know where your knee is in space, you know, what angle it's at and all that kind of thing. And so your brain changes its wiring and restructures itself and uses your eyes, your visual information more than it would normally. So then when your knee's better and you're all repaired, then your brain's gonna have to retrain itself again in order to put itself back into the, into the zone that it was before. So th they're really changeable. They're amazing things, brains. They adapt really, really well. and, and what we want to know is, is how to encourage the brain to readapt in the right way in in epilepsy and, and go back to a, a more stable state. Do you know, you've just made me think of this personal thing. This is like really random, but <laughs> I wanted to challenge my own brain. Um, so I was like looking at my toes and thought, I just want to wiggle one of them on its own. And, it, and I was so stubborn. It's like, but it took me months and I managed to do it. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to do another one and I'm like looking at it and it's hardly moving, but I keep focusing and it's starting to move on its own. Is that an example really? Of yeah, that, no, that's you... exactly the kind of thing. Um, you know, I play the piano. Uh, oh, same. Um, yeah, but same. as you will know, that fourth finger, ma making that one move independently is oh. really, really tough. And you spend a lot of time and training, practicing that, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and of course, you know, if you're learning a difficult piece, it can take months you know in my case many months <laughs> me i'm learning bohemian rhapsody at the moment and uh, in one of the segments when i'm going uh, uh, like really hard and i have to like you're saying using my fourth finger along with my second finger and and then trying not to bash the other keys with my other fingers it's really hard but mm -hmm. over time it's becoming you know simpler and easier but it's really tough but it shows that you can do it if you practice right yeah absolutely you've got to train that brain definitely <laughs> relating that though to epilepsy what does that mean for people who are having seizures or uncontrolled seizures is there any way that people can alter the state of their brain long term do you think I, I, that's very difficult i think um mm. you would need some kind of feedback some kind of special some biofeedback to be able to achieve that uh, yeah. and, and I, I think that's much more difficult prospect uh, I wouldn't say it's impossible, you know, people are amazing, uh, but, but that, it's not something that, uh, that that I have a huge amount of knowledge of, I'm afraid. <laughs> Isn't the brain just incredible and impressive, but also utterly, utterly frustrating? I, I go from moment to moment reading stuff and learning about the amazing research that people like yourself do and thinking, wow, isn't the brain amazing? But it's also, amazing awfully amazing how many issues we also have with the brain yeah no it, it's true uh it, it's a very very complicated thing there are many many ways for it to go wrong uh you know um absolutely um but but at the same time you know uh it's it gives us hope because there, there are so many different yeah. routes towards being able to fix brains you know surely one of them will work at some point <laughs> what can we expect in the next 10 years do you reckon? Well, neuroscience is, is young. It, it's only been going since the mm -hmm. 1960s, really. Um, so it, it's it's really at a, the point now where it's about to really flower, I think, as a, as a, as a subject, as a topic. Um, new imaging techniques are coming along all the time. Um, I'm doing my level best to try and buy a, a really fancy MRI machine that we can put rats and mice in and mm. scan them at incredible detail. Um, oh, and Sounds amazing. We, we've got all these new things, these new drug libraries that I was just talking about earlier. Um, I think there's, we can expect great things to happen over the next um, 
decade or two uh, in neuroscience. Um, our ability to control brain cells with lasers, to control them specifically with certain drugs, um, you, you know, there's a lot of amazing things we can do. We can edit DNA now uh, almost as if we were editing a document in Word. So <laughs> with all of these fantastic yeah. capabilities that, that are happening, um, will we'll transform our understanding of the brain over the next 20 years, I would say. And if people want to learn more about your work and what you do, where can they go? Um, you can Google me and, and the university's got um, my work on, on, on its website. It's a university website, so it's moderately rubbish and not very searchable. Um, <laughs> Won't tell your website guys about that, but yeah. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, yeah, they can go out, they can go on there uh, and, 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 and find out about my work uh, and you can also look up the uh, Aston Institute for Health and Neurodevelopment as well where there are lots of us colleagues who are working on epilepsy together. Uh, I really want people to know that we have people like yourself and your colleagues out there that we hardly hear about or your average Joe hardly ever hears about what's actually going on and for how long the research has been going. I mean, you said well, neuroscience hasn't really been going since the 1960s, but yeah, I think we kind of forget that is like 60 years ago. So although it's been slow from the beginning, things are speeding up and a lot has been discovered, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, in the 1960s, we, we, all, we hardly knew how a neuron, one neuron talks to another and, and now you know, we've got maps of the brain uh, at incredible uh, levels of detail, uh, you know. I love it when they look pretty and you put the different colours in and it makes it much more easy for us laymen to identify the different parts and different activities. Yeah, right? absolutely. But, the, the, you know, the, the new microscopes are providing phenomenal. So if you take a, a piece of the brain that's the size of a pinhead, um, within a volume uh, that size, we, you would have, uh, if you look at the branches of the brain cells, the little branches that come out and receive the information, you'd have Identics. just over 250 meters of branches in that pinhead sized piece of brain, if you added them that's all together. Nuts. So that's, a, that's an, you know, an enormous wow. <laughs> amount of, um, wow. of, of, of capability to take in information and process it in that pinhead sized piece of brain and then you think of the number of neurons that we have like you say billions mm -hmm. then the number of synapses between all of those branches mm -hmm. it is astonishing that more does not go it, wrong yeah, with each no, of our brains, right? yeah yeah the numbers are amazing when you look thanks so much to gavin for today sharing with us what he brings to people affected by epilepsy their families their carers and society as a whole and that is ongoing, greater in-depth understanding of the epilepsies, which shall long term lead to more effective care and treatments. Next week, I shall be chatting to Dr. Janine Winterbottom, an advanced nurse specialist in epilepsy at the Walton Centre NHS Foundation Trust in Liverpool in the UK, all about her NIHR National Institute for Health Research funded research into developing a preconception care pathway for women with epilepsy. Follow me on Twitter, LinkedIn or Facebook and we'd love to hear from you if you have any thoughts about today's show. Do subscribe to our podcast and know that we are always trying to improve what we are doing here for the programme. I'm Tori Robinson. Thanks for listening.